um, your assignment so that you can get a better grade on them. Um, I'll grade them again tomorrow. All right. Um, today we're going to be talking about the Constitutional Convention and the Constitutional Compromises that arose during the Convention. Um, last time we talked about the Articles Confederation and the flaws in the Articles and how it created a system of government that was not an effective one, that did not serve this country as well as it should. After Shays Rebellion, our Founding Fathers realized that they need to move on from the Articles Confederation, that they need a better Constitution. So in 1787, one of the most important dates in this class, 1787, 13 years of rule under the Articles Confederation have passed by. In 1787, our founding fathers decided that they need to replace the Articles. So 55 people from all over the 13 states gathered together in the city of, uh, of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. They have one goal in mind, and that is writing and adopting a new constitution for the United States, something that would replace the Articles Confederation. Today, we call this meeting as the Constitutional Convention because they're gonna write a new constitution. We also call this meeting the Philadelphia Convention. The document that they're going to write is a revolutionary one, a document that we simply know as the United States Constitution that has served us for about 200 years now. This document will be the basis of other countries' constitutions, Mexico's constitutions, Canada's constitution, the South American countries' constitutions. A lot of them are based on our constitution, on the United States, the, the document that they're going to write in this building in this year of 1787. So 55 people. Again, the goal is to write a new constitution you need to know who these 55 people were because that's going to give you a glimpse of why they wrote the things that they wrote in the US Constitution, why our government looks like the way it is today. These 55 people were not commoners. They were not the typical American at the time. A lot of them are landowners. A lot of them are very wealthy. A lot of them are highly educated. You could say that most of these 55 people were part of which class of people? Uh, the elites. They're part of the elite. This constitution was not written by people like you and me. They were written by highly educated, uber wealthy people of the United States. So the things that they're going to write in the U.S. Constitution will reflect that fact, especially the fact that the elite of the United States at the time were very much afraid of mob mentality, of mob rule. And they're going to try to put in place in the US Constitution safeguards against mob rule, against the majority of the United States taking over and taking away the minorities' rights and the minorities' properties. That's something that they're gonna um, be wary of when they're writing the US Constitution. They were led by this man over here. This man standing, he presided over this meeting. Everybody should know him because he is George Washington the leader of the Continental Army. He is not president at this time because if you all remember in the Articles Confederation, there was no such thing as an executive branch, so we did not have a president. So he's not president yet. Once the US Constitution gets adapted and we create a, an executive branch, he will be the first president of the United States. But in 1787, he's just one of these 55 people sitting down because he's very old is Benjamin Franklin. He's about 80 years old in 1787. He's about to die. Before he dies, he contributes to the writing of the U.S. Constitution. However, the guy you really need to remember, the chief architect of this document, the genius that is behind the U.S. Constitution, is a man from Virginia named James Madison. You need to write that down as a primary writer. If you ever get a question of who is the father of the Constitution, it is James Madison, also a future president someday, but for right now, he is the chief architect of this document. He had a lot of contributions from these 55 people, but especially a young delegate from the city, from the state of New York. Can anybody guess who he is? He had a lot of input from this guy. Those of you who are fans of musicals, his name is Alexander Hamilton. So a lot of Alexander Hamilton's ideas are going to be in the US Constitution as well. So the most brilliant minds of the United States will get together, will come together to write this US Constitution. The US Constitution that you guys went over yesterday on your assignment, so hopefully most of you have done that assignment. So let's talk about the main difference between the Articles and this U.S. Constitution. The main difference is the structure of power. In the Articles Confederation, it was a confederacy. 
The state governments were the ones with power. The national government was weak. Well, no longer. In the U.S. Constitution, it's not that the national government is more powerful, although some people would argue that it is. It is that now the national government is empowered. The national government is certainly more powerful than it once was. Under the Articles of Confederation, the national government was not very authoritative. It was not very powerful. It did not possess a lot of authority. Most of that was given to the state governments. Well, no longer. This national government will be a little beefier with more authority, with more power. Now with three branches instead of one, a presidency and national court as well. Now with the power to tax, the power to raise revenue. Now with the ability to create and raise a centralized armed forces with the sole ability to do so. We're going to take some of that away from the states. Not only will the national government be more powerful, some powers that used to be given to the states, like the ability to print money and the ability to control trade, that's going to be given to the national government now. So that's the major difference. But like I told you, the people that wrote the Constitution of the United States were from all over the 13 states, representing different wants, needs, and interests. Some represented the South, some represented the North, some represent banks, some represented traders, some represent farmers. They're going to have different agendas. They're going to have different things that they want to include in the United States Constitution. It's not going to be a clear-cut thing. It's not like they spent a day writing down the U.S. Constitution. There's going to be a lot of disagreements in this convention. Not everyone is going to agree on what to put down in the U.S. Constitution. But the beauty of early America that you don't really see today anymore is they knew, our founding fathers knew, they had a goal. They had a problem that they need to fix. And they may have disagreements, but they knew they need to get over those disagreements in order to solve the problem. So these disagreements are going to be settled with compromises, something that our people in Congress today don't often do. They are going to give up something in order to get something back in return. They're not going to be stubborn and not getting anything done like our government is today. All right. So one of the disagreements that arose during the convention, during this meeting, is about Congress, about the legislative branch of the United States. In the Articles of Confederation, the structure of Congress, the legislative branch, was very simple. In the Articles of Confederation, the national government only had one branch, a Congress, a legislative branch that created policies, national policies and laws. It only had one branch, I'm sorry, one house one chamber. It's called a unicameral legislature. One group of people making laws. In that Congress, each state gets to elect one representative. So there were 13 states at a time. There were 13 representatives. Each state gets one vote. When we're deciding whether or not a law should pass or a law should fail, each state has one representative with one vote each. Each state is equal in the Articles of Confederation. Well, now we're scrapping the articles. We're creating a new Congress, a new legislative branch. And some people felt like the system under the Articles of Confederation was inherently unfair. Who is it unfair to? Who is it unfair to? The thing that I just talked about, the Congress that I just talked about under the Articles of Confederation, where all states are equal, who is it unfair to? Why, does it, why is this unfair? If every state gets one vote, if every state has the same power in Congress, why is that unfair? Uh, Some like, states are a lot bigger than others. Very good, Luis and Marina. Some states have more people. Some states are more populous than other states. Like, for example, the state of Virginia, the most populous state out of the 13 states at a time, had, for example, five times more people than the state of New Jersey. Yet they only get one representative and they only get one vote when they're deciding whether or not a law will pass or a law would fail. So bigger states saw this opportunity and they decided we need to make Congress fairer. We need to make representation in Congress more fair for the more popular states in the union. So they submitted a proposal. They named it the Virginia plan under the, un, with the name of the biggest state of the United States, Virginia. Under the Virginia plan, the bigger states called for two houses of Congress, two groups of people making national policies, two groups, two chambers creating policies. This is known as a bicameral legislature. 
as opposed to a unicameral. Bicameral means two chambers, two houses. So we're gonna have two groups of people making laws. Representation in each one of these houses for the states will be dependent on population. The more people you have in your state, the more representatives, therefore the more votes your state will get when it comes to deciding whether or not a law will pass or a law will fail. Everyone good with me so far? Two houses of Congress is what the Virginia plan is proposing and representation will depend on population. The size of a state will matter when it comes to representation and the amount of votes a state will get when deciding whether or not a national policy will pass or a national thought policy will be rejected. Now, of course, the smaller states in the union, like New Jersey and Rhode Island and Connecticut, this is not something they would agree with. For the smaller states, if this plan was adopted and if this plan was put into the U.S. Constitution, then from then on, the bigger states will rule the United States. The wants and the needs of the smaller states of the United States will forever be ignored. If there is a policy that is good for a big state, but is bad for a small state, then it won't matter. The big states will always get what they want because each and every time the smaller states will be outvoted. So the smaller states propose their own plan. They called it the New Jersey plan. And it's very similar to what we had in the Articles of Confederation. One house of Congress, a unicameral legislature, one house. Each state will have one representative, just like in the Articles of Confederation. It does not matter if you're big Virginia or small New Jersey, you get one representative, you get one vote. All states are equal under the New Jersey plan, under the, this proposed plan, just like they were in the Articles of Confederation. So they're at an impasse. Bigger states want the Virginia plan, smaller state, the, the delegates from the smaller states wanted the New Jersey plan. Which plan did we go with? Which plan is in the Constitution today? Which plan did the deals 55 people finally agreed upon? Did we choose the Virginia plan or did we adopt the New Jersey plan? The New Jersey plan. So I'm saying New Jersey plan. Didn't we adopt both? So what we did is we're going to come up with a compromise. We're going to take ideas from the Virginia plan and we're going to take ideas from the New Jersey plan, smush them together. And this is the reason we have the Congress that we have today. We have the legislative branch that we have today. It's called, you need to remember this, it's called the Great Compromise. The Great Compromise. The bigger states and the smaller states came to an agreement. So here's what it says in Article 1 of the United States Constitution. This is what we put into the U.S. Constitution. From the Virginia plan, we're going to take the idea of a bicameral legislature. We're going to have a Congress that has two houses, two groups of people, two chambers making laws. Can anyone name those two chambers? What are the two chambers of Congress today? Because of the Great Compromise, we adapted the idea of two houses of, co of Congress. So Congress today, the legislative branch of the United States, has two houses. Name them. Uh the Senate and the House of Representatives? Very good. Very good, sir. The Senate is one house and the House of Representatives is the other house. So we have two chambers, a bicameral legislature today because of the Great Compromise. Everyone with me so far? Everyone confused so far? These were the people that got attacked last week because they were counting the electoral votes. So the Senate works here on this wing of the Capitol building. The House of Representatives works over here in this wing of the Capitol building. To make the bigger states happy in the House of Representatives, population will matter. The bigger your state is, the more representation your state have, the more representatives your state can elect to this chamber, to this House of Congress. So population matters in the House. Does anyone know? Who has the most people in terms of population? Who has the most people out of the 50 states of the United States? Who has the most people? Anyone know? Which state? Alaska? Or Alaska is the biggest in terms of land mass, but they are far from the most people. Most of it is ice. Okay. What? I'm sorry. Not quite. Gavino is right. California. 40 million Californians live in the state of California. They have the biggest population, which means they have the most representatives in the House of Representatives. To give you an idea, this is the breakdown of how many representatives each state have. 
that number depends on population in the House of Representatives. So a state like California with the biggest population in the United States has 53 representatives. So there are 53 Californians in the House of Representatives today. There are 53 congressmen from California. Texas, our state is the second biggest in, in all of the 50 states. We have 36 representatives to the House including your representative for the Rio Grande Valley. His name is Vicente Gonzalez. He's one of these 36 Texans that represent us in the United States House of Representatives. Population matters. Look, over, look at these states over here. What can you tell me about these states? They only have one person representing them in the House of Representatives. What does that suggest? Uh, they, they have, have a small population. They have a small population. Their populations are very small compared to the population of all the other states. Because in the House of Representatives, population matters. The bigger your state is, the more representation you have, the more power you have in that chamber of Congress. Anyone have any questions so far? So that's the House of Representatives. Let's make the small states happy with the other House of Congress. Let's make them happy with the Senate. In the United States Senate, just like the New Jersey plan proposed, population is irrelevant. All states have equal representation, but instead of one representative for each state, we're gonna have two representatives from each state two senators representing each state. It does not matter if you're the biggest state in the United States like California or the, you're the smallest one like Wyoming. You get two senators each, regardless of how many people that live in your state. Representation for each state will be equal. All right, alarmingly, my first period, they took a while to answer this question. Hopefully it's not gonna be the same thing here. Because of the great compromise, how many senators do we have working in the US Senate today? Uh -oh. Very good, 100 senators. There's 50 states in the union. Each state gets to have two senators each. So we have 100 senators, two from Alaska, two from Hawaii, two from New York. Does anyone here know who your two senators are from? I mean, sorry. Who are your two senators from the from the state of Texas that represents Texas in the United States Senate? One of them was in the news a week ago because he might have caused a riot. Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz is one of them. Yes, very good. And the other one's name, people always forget the other one. His name is John Cornyn. So Ted Cruz and John Cornyn are your Texas representatives to the United States Senate. Again, two per each state. Doesn't matter if you're big California or small Wyoming, you get two. This is the great compromise. This is in our constitution today. Thanks to the disagreement that took place between the bigger states and the smaller states, the great compromise established the structure of our US Congress today. Now, there, it, still, it still has an impact today. One of the biggest impact is in the Senate. Some states are underrepresented and some states are overrepresented in the Senate because remember population doesn't matter in the Senate. So for example, in the US Senate, each Senator from the state of California represents 20 million Californians. However, each Senator from the state of Wyoming only represents about 250,000 Wyomings. Wyoming is overrepresented in the U.S. Senate, while California and the bigger states like ours and New York and Florida are underrepresented in the U.S. Senate. And this is the impact of the great compromise that happened 200 years ago in the Philadelphia Convention. It's just a fact that in the U.S. Senate, some states are overrepresented and some states are just underrepresented. Thanks to this compromise. All right. Anyone have any questions so far? Another disagreement in the, in the Constitutional Convention was in regards to slavery. Remember some of these delegates, some of these 55 people came from the Southern states, which had a lot of slaves. And some of these people came from the Northern states, which a lot of them have banned slavery um, already. But the disagreement is not what you think it is. The disagreement was not whether or not we should continue slavery in the United States or whether or not we should ban slavery in the US Constitution. That was not even on the table. No one was talking about that because they knew if that was even suggested in the Constitutional Convention, the Southern states are gonna say, screw this, we're not gonna be a part of this and they won't have a US Constitution in the end. 
So no one, this is not an argument in the Philadelphia Convention. Everyone pretty much agreed that this, this institution of slavery, however immoral some people might think it is, will have to continue in the United States if they still want to get the Southern states on board with a new constitution. So the question is, what was the disagreement regarding slavery if it's not whether or not we should ban it in the US constitution? What is the disagreement? If slaves were considered citizens. If slaves were considered citizens, that issue is already settled with a big no. They're not gonna be able to vote. They're not citizens of a country, of a state. What's the issue, guys? But that's a good guess, Gavino. That's close to what I want. Like body count? Very good. Remember what we just talked about. In the House of Representatives of the United States Congress, population will matter. The disagreement is, does, does a slave count as part of a state's population? They're not going to vote. They're, they technically don't have any rights. But do they count as part of a state's population? Which states would want them to count? Southern states. The, the southern ones? states. The southern states had a lot of slaves, and if their slaves counted as part of their population, that would be a big boost to their number, which means more representation in the House of Representatives, which means more power for the southern states in the House when, they were when they're deciding whether or not a law will pass or a law will fail. Northerners do not want slaves to count because they did not have a lot of slaves. So this, this ironic thing happening here. You have delegates from the north who most of their states have banned slavery a long time ago that are saying we should not count slaves because they're property. It would be like counting your car as part of a state's population. And you have Southerners or Southern delegates who are making these people's lives miserable every day, who are enslaving these people saying we should count them because they're people too. Now they have no intention of letting them vote anyway. So this is where we get to a compromise. It's called a three-fifths compromise. And this is still in the Constitution today, believe it or not. Get a copy of the U.S. Constitution. Read Article 1 of the U.S. Constitution where it talks about Congress. And you can still find this. This is one of the most racist things that are in the U.S. Constitution. The compromise was instead of counting a slave as one person, like they would do a white person, they will count each slave as three-fifths of a person. He will be counted as less than a human being. For the purposes of the House of Representatives, each slave will count as three-fifths of a person. So if a state has five slaves, that would be equivalent to three people. Because each slave, for the purposes of the U.S. government, counts less than a human being. So this is called the three-fifths compromise. And this is still in the Constitution today. Now, it doesn't matter anymore because we don't have slaves anymore because of the 13th Amendment. But this is something... Um, that we put into this constitution that we're so proud of. All right, another issue during the convention is the international slave trade. At the time, the United States, like other uh, countries around the world, participated in buying and selling of slaves from Africa or from the Caribbean, buying and selling of slaves from other countries. Some people, especially the Northerners, felt that this was an immoral thing that we should discontinue participating in. Again, this is not an, a debate about slavery or, or no slavery. This is a debate of whether or not we should continue buying and selling slaves from other countries, especially from Africa. Well, again, you got Southern states that want to continue participating in the slave trade, and you got Northern states that don't want to continue participating in the slave trades any longer. What our founding fathers decided in Philadelphia is the same way you guys, the same way you guys do when you're faced with like a difficult homework, when you're doing your chemistry or your calculus homework and it's too hard for you. What do you do? You don't do it. You don't do it. You give up and you put it off for another time. That's exactly what our founding fathers did. This was a difficult decision. They didn't want to offend anyone. So what they decided is they're not going to touch the issue of the international slave trade for 20 years. They forbid specifically in the U.S. Constitution for the United States Congress to make any policy, to make any action in regards to the international slave trade for 20 years. We're going to let it continue. We're not going to allow the U.S. government to do anything about it. 
after 20 years, when that 20 years expire, then the US Congress can go ahead and do something about it and they can go ahead and outright ban it if they want to. That's exactly what happened 20 years after the convention. In 1807, the United States Congress banned the American participation in the international slave trade. That does not mean slavery did not continue in the United States. It does not mean I cannot buy or sell my slave to my neighbor. It just meant that I can't get them from Africa any longer. Does that make sense for everybody? So the decision that they decided is, let's put it off for our descendants. It's a very hard decision. Let's, uh, let's uh, let our children take care of it. Anyone have any questions so far? Another issue is how much power should we give the common people of the United States? How much power should we give to the masses of the United States? This is a debate between two opposing viewpoints, two opposing democratic theory. This is a debate between participatory democracy versus elite democracy. Who should have influence over this new United States government bestowed with all of this power? And predictably, since most of our founding fathers, most of the framers of the Constitution were part of the elite class of the United States, uh, most of the things that they put down in the U.S. Constitution is geared towards having an elite democracy. If you don't believe me, let's go ahead and go through your U.S. government. The U.S. government under the U.S. Constitution has three branches, an executive, a legislative, and a judicial branch. Let's go over the legislative branch. Congress, because of the Great Compromise, has two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate. In the Senate, Originally, as our founding fathers intended, the two senators coming from each state were not directly elected by the American people. The people of a state did not get to choose their senators directly. They were forbidden from doing so by the U.S. Constitution. Instead, the state governments were the ones that appointed these two senators the people of the United States and the people of the states were not responsible for directly electing these senators. Now, it does not mean we didn't have influence over who becomes our senators because, truthfully, the people elect the people in the state governments and the state governments are the ones that appointed the senators. So we have some say, but it's not direct. We did not, we do not, we weren't able to directly elect the senators that would represent us in the U.S. Senate because our founding fathers felt like that decision was too important to be left to our direct control. So instead, they made it, they wrote in the Constitution that it will be the job of the state governments, the few people in the state governments that were elected by the people to select who the senators will be. Everyone with me so far? Now, this has changed today. Um, senators today are elected directly by the American people, but it would take a constitutional amendment in order to make the system more democratic. This is not what our founding fathers intended. We had to change the constitution in order for us to directly elect our senators. Does anyone know which amendment allowed for the direct election of senators? Which amendment allowed for the direct election of U.S. Senators? Mr. Valletta is rolling over his grave. Very good, Lorenzo. The 17th Amendment to the Constitution allowed for the direct election of U.S. Senators. But again, an amendment had to be introduced, had to be added to the U.S. Constitution for that to happen. That was not the original intention of the founding fathers of the Constitution. Let's take a look at the judicial branch, the national courts or the federal courts of the United States, the judges and the justices that serve in the United States courts. How do you become a federal judge? How do you become a justice of the Supreme Court or a judge in the lower federal courts of the judicial branch of the United States? You get appointed. You get appointed by who? I... I think the Supreme is by the president, right? 
the Supreme Court's arrest read all the courts, all the judge yeah. positions and, and the justice positions of the Supreme Court, like Dylan says, are appointed by the president of the United States. Again, we do not elect them. Those judges that are serving in the courts today are not elected by the, the state judges for the state of Texas are elected by the people of Texas, but the federal judges, the national judges serving in the U.S. courts were not elected by the American people, but instead appointed by the president of the United States. Now, again, it's not like we don't have influence over that. We have influence over who becomes the next president. And in turn, the president chooses the judges that will serve in the judicial branch. So we have some influence, but again, we are denied direct influence. We don't get to directly elect them even today. If you need more evidence, Let's take a look at the last branch of the U.S. government, the executive branch, the presidency. Your vote in November, like I told you before, is merely a suggestion, was intended for our founding fathers to merely be a suggestion for the real people who will choose the next president of the United States, which are who? Who directly chooses who's going to be the next president of the United States? The Electoral College. The Electoral College. A handful of people from each state selects who's going to be the next president of the United States. The people's votes are merely a suggestion to those electors so that they can make the decision that the people want them to make. But the thinking was, if the people of the United States goes with someone who is charismatic but bad for the country, the electors of the Electoral College can turn around and vote for somebody else. Even today, that is the case. If those electors wanted to, they can ignore the will of their state and they can vote for whoever they want, ignoring the popular vote of their state. Because again, our founding fathers thought that power is too important. The, the ability to select the next president of the United States is too important to be left in the direct hands of the American people. Again, don't ever put on your essay, we don't have influence over this. We don't have influence over this. We do. We have some, but we do not have direct influence. Anyone have any questions? If you're looking for participatory democracy in the U.S. government, as originally intended by our founding fathers, there is only one place where you can find it. It's not in the executive, it's not in the judicial. The legislative branch has two houses, right? The Senate we talked about already, the House of Representatives is the only place where you can actually find participatory democracy. From the very beginning, the inception of the US Constitution, the representatives of the House of Representatives were directly elected by the people of their state. So if you ever come across a question is, what part of the US Constitution best represents participatory democracy? More often than not, the answer will be the House of Representatives because from the very beginning, it did not take a constitutional amendment like in the Senate to do this. We were able to directly elect our representatives to the House. Make sense so far? Anyone have any questions so far? All right. Another compromise that we need to talk about is a compromise about trade and commerce. In this new US constitution, the national government will be in charge of a lot of the economy. They will be in charge of printing money. They can tax now like the state governments can. They're in charge of interstate commerce, which is trading between states. If you all remember back then, states were in charge of their commerce from, uh, with other states which made them compete with each other. They're gonna be in charge of international commerce also. The US government is in charge of all of that today. All of those economic powers are going to be given to the US government by this new constitution. However, the Southern states were afraid that if the US government was given the power to tax exports, anybody know what exports are? Foreign goods foreign goods. I want a more coherent definition. You're close. Imports are goods that come from other countries. So what are exports? Goods that we send to other countries. Exactly. Goods that we sell to other countries. So what Southern States said is we cannot let the U.S. government tax exports 
because the southern economy relies on crops, especially cotton, to be sold to other countries like France and Great Britain. And if the United States government is able to tax those exports, it would limit their ability to sell goods to other countries. So what the southern states wanted in the U.S. Constitution specifically was for the U.S. government to be forbidden from taxing exports. So the U.S. government today, according to the U.S. Constitution, cannot impose taxes on goods that we sell to other countries. If Luis over here starts a car company and he wants to sell to Japan, the U.S. government cannot tax those goods, they cannot tax those exports because they don't want to limit Luis's ability to sell to other countries. Make sense so far? Anyone confused so far? All right, guys. You have an assignment today. I'll take one last correction tomorrow for your one and two. So if you need a better grade for those, make sure you do, especially those of you that are turning in late, you can still get a better grade on those. Just make sure that you correct what you need to correct. Um, today you have an assignment, assignment three, and then tomorrow make sure you do your asynchronous assignment. Your assignment today, I'll just give you a hint. One, two, and three were in regards to the notes that we took from yesterday from your asynchronous assignment from yesterday. So if you have not done the assignment from yesterday, I suggest you do that first because you're gonna get confused with this assignment today. There's only one question on today's homework pertaining to what we talked about right now. So if you haven't done the, the quiz from the Ed Puzzle from yesterday, make sure you watch that video so that you'll be able to answer the questions for today. If you don't have any other questions, guys, thank you for coming today. I'll see you all tomorrow. I'm sorry, on Friday. Have a good day. Make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Those of you that have questions, remain behind. I'll try to answer whatever questions you may have. Thank you for coming today, guys. Bye, sir. Have a nice day. Bye, Bye, bye guys. See you, sir. We'll see you, guys. Bye. Sir.